I'm a big dreamer, I dream like crazy, so I've dreamt all night that I'm fine, that I'm doing all the stuff that I love to do. And then I wake up, and every time I wake up, you're shocked because you don't want it to be true. You don't want it to be true that you're in the shape that you're in. And literally two seconds ago, in your mind, you weren't. My name is Yelena Ristic, and I suffer from Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome Type 3. When I was first diagnosed with EDS, my initial reaction was disbelief. But EDS Type 3 affects specifically ligaments and tendons most often. So they stretch out, they become weak, uh, and you can literally sprain your ankle doing nothing, like just walking around. Um, and, that, and that's a mild form. You can have dislocations, so complete dislocation of a shoulder, of a hip, of a wrist, which is excruciating. And on top of it, it can cause nerve involvement where the bones press on nerves, and that happened to me where I got some nerve damage. I always, and I even said it to doctors, if, if you gave me a gun right now, or if you gave me the option of giving me a shot and putting me to sleep right now, I would accept without hesitation. On February 6, 2015, the Supreme Court of Canada unanimously ruled to strike down the ban on physician-assisted death. The new ruling will allow for anyone with an irremediable or grievous medical condition to be eligible for physician-assisted death. One of the leading voices supporting the legalization was Dr. Donald Lowe, an infectious disease specialist at Mount Sinai Hospital. Dr. Lowe was diagnosed with a brainstem tumor and released the following video in September 2013. I mean, why? Why make people suffer for no reason when there's an alternative? I just don't understand it. Eight days after filming this video, Dr. Lowe passed away. He had been put into terminal sedation days before his death. Lowe's widow and current physician's assistant, Maureen Taylor, explains how physician-assisted death would have helped her husband. When I think back, we didn't really have a goodbye because you don't know the coma isn't something that happens instantly. You sort of do it gradually, adjusting the dose. I think, though, that I don't regret any of that. We, we had a lot of time to talk about our life together and how grateful we were for the time we had together. So I don't, I don't regret any of that, but I just regret that what he never wanted, which was to be uh, totally dependent, and uh, unable to communicate with his family or swallow food, enjoying the things that he loved, um, it all happened the way he didn't want it to happen, and it's so unnecessary. I celebrated not, obviously, too late for Don, but for other people who will face this in the future, maybe even me, who knows, one day. Um, and just that we have matured, as Don put it, to a level where this is what Canadians have asked for, this is what people want, they want an option. The legalization of physician-assisted dying will have more gray area than many physicians would have hoped for. Dr. Will Johnston, a family physician and chair of the Euthanasia Prevention Coalition, spoke to us after a lecture where he expressed his concerns. It makes people throw away life. It empowers people around them who may have an agenda. It's totally unnecessary. And on top of that, it turns our hospitals from a safe space where no one could be steered toward assisted suicide or euthanasia into a space where potentially the shadow of, of these practices could fall on everyone. However, people who are suffering like Yelena are relieved by the court's decision. Um, I thought, honestly, that we'd become more civilized and humane as a nation because um, you know, it's something that has been, it's been questioned, it's been around for a very long time. And I think it took a lot of oppression off of people who are already living very oppressed lives. Yelena was diagnosed with EDS in 2014 after suffering a dance injury five years before that was continuously mistreated. I saw dozens of doctors, including physiatrists, rheumatologists, and orthopedic surgeons who all should have been aware of Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome and should have known to test me for it, and none of them did. And then I was prescribed all the wrong treatments and some of the right treatments, but in excess. Because when you have Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, you may be able to have a surgery or you may be able to do physio or you may be able, but it has to be prescribed much more gently and it has to be done in the, the gentlest way possible. 
I disabled myself by listening to other people. Before her diagnosis, Yelena was living life to the fullest. I was everywhere doing everything. I was flamenco dancing, I was salsa dancing, and hiking. I traveled and I hiked in the Andes. I was super, super active. I decided to get into teaching and I loved it. I absolutely loved it. For me, it was more a vocation than, a, than just a job. I loved seeing the students every day, um, I loved my hours, I loved my pay, and basically my colleagues, it was just like a dream job. Once diagnosed with EDS, Yelena's life drastically changed. Her marriage fell apart and she lost the ability to do any physical activity. Every single morning the first thing I do when I wake up is I cry for hours because I know it's going to be the same day, every single day. Nothing will change. There's no chance I could go out and meet someone new. There's no chance I could fall in love. There's no chance that I could get a different career. Yelena now lives with her parents in their multi-level home. As a result of her condition, she is confined to the second floor. I, I don't use the bathroom bathroom. There's a potty that my parents have to clean out several times a day because I would have to go up and down stairs to use the bathroom. And I can't do that on a regular basis. Um, showering, um, you know, I go seven, honestly, seven to ten days sometimes because I'm terrified of one-upping it up the stairs and my, I'm feeling some symptoms on my right side that, God forbid, I damage my right side and then I'll have no sides that are good and I won't be able to get out of bed. So I have to go through a lot of anxiety to get the courage to go and shower and then deal with that. And literally, like if I drop something on the floor, I have a reacher. I use it to lift something up, but if my reacher falls down, That's I'm out of luck. Since Yelena cannot care for herself, the burden of basic tasks fall on her parents, but especially her mother, Miroslava Ristic. My role is everything. I have to prepare food for her, I have to feed her, I have to remind her to take medications, I have to pick up medications, I have to take her for the doctor's appointments, I have to take her for treatments. It's an emotional hell, it's a physical hell, it's a financial hell, it's just everything together and it's awful. It's really, I don't know how I'm alive, I don't know how I move, I honestly don't know. It got to be loved. It kills me that they have to watch me go through this. It kills me that it's at least not made easier by our healthcare system where they would offer assistance. Like I was literally once in emergency, unable to stand, falling down, passing out from pain. And I said it was back pain and I was told in eMERGE and with a family doctor, as long as you can wiggle your toes and we know it's not nerve damage, you don't get an MRI. So my parents had to hire an ambulance because I couldn't even sit at all, like not even like this at that point because I'd just been freshly injured my nerves. And we had to drive over the border and spend over $2,000 just to get an MRI for me. When it comes to Yelena considering assisted death, her mother is 50-50 on the decision. For all these years, she's telling me that she wants to die because wherever we go to ask for help, we hit the wall. And when you get rejected so many times, the only thing that you can think is that, oh, there is nobody that cares about me. I'm not going to stop her if she wants that. But if she doesn't, then I'm going to do it too. Yelena believes she is living with a less than zero quality of life. Palliative care physician, Dr. James Downer, believes people like her should have the right to assisted death. There are obviously situations and types of suffering that we can't relieve. And, and forcing somebody to endure a state of living that they don't find dignified and they don't find to be of quality, I, I, I just don't see the value in that. that. That's the problem because there's no, there's, there are really no edges to the concept of quality of life. You know, there's no, no place where it starts and stops. The court gave the federal government 12 months to craft legislation in response to the ruling. But one of the hottest debates right now is who will conduct it. It is a shared responsibility among the profession to make sure that the service is available to everybody and I don't have a strong personal objection to performing it so if I am asked to uh, and I am the appropriate person to do it I, I believe that I would um, and if one of my colleagues was unable to perform it for reasons of conscience I believe I could step in and help them. I don't think anyone should be doing it 
But I, I think it's re what's really important is that we maintain a safe space in the healthcare system where, where um, uh, people can go and they know that they themselves won't be, uh, won't be steered toward assisted suicide or euthanasia. If the federal government misses the deadline, the legislation will fall into the hands of the provinces. Taylor is currently the co-chair of a cross-Canada panel that is studying how physician-assisted dying should operate. We have heard over and over again from stakeholder groups that this should be a pan-Canadian approach, that we don't want a patchwork of different laws and access across the country like there is with abortion, where women don't have access to abortion in a couple of provinces. Nobody wants that. So we're going to try, hoping that the provinces, except for maybe Quebec, because they already have their own law, will come at this with a unified approach. Once physician-assisted death becomes legal, People like Yelena will be faced with the question of when they will go through with it. It depends on what I'm able to achieve with my GoFundMe campaign and treatments in the U.S. If they can uh, reverse my injuries to a point where I can have a semi-decent quality of life, then it'll be off the table. But if they can't, then I will go through with it. But I can't say it's six months to a year, I'd probably know. Yelena has one clear message when speaking to anyone who judges her decision. I only wish you could live my life for a week and then tell me whether I'm weak or not. Tell me again whether you feel the same way. For the Ryerson Documentary Unit, I'm Emily Silva.